Hey Jeff, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. 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 Same. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's really nice to have have you uh, back again. And just 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 for the benefit of our audience, thank you for doing this again. We we recorded this first time, and uh, it it was completely my fault. <laughs> the Zoom video didn't get recorded. But thank you again for coming back. Uh, I think th this just shows how kind of person you are like you're so generous uh, with with your time and you're helping the community coming on this uh like uh in, in on this interview again thank you so much yeah no thanks my pleasure so let's let's start with the uh i guess uh introduction i i guess people want to know who you are i mean i i'm, I'm a big fan of of you already so uh, you, you don't need to tell me but t tell tell the audience it's like who you are what, what's your background sure um, yeah, I guess I can do a quick bio, right? So I did my undergrad in electrical engineering at UC Irvine. I uh, graduated in 2013, and then I minored in computer science back then. And after that, I went to Columbia University to study computational theory to get my master's degree. So I like to joke with people that I did a physics major in undergrad and a math major in graduate school. <laughs> so um, <laughs> both of which are not uh, things you can really get a job with necessarily, right? At least you have more opportunities with engineering. So I joined Yahoo and became a backend engineer doing Node.js. I mean, I was a little, at first I was a little bit miffed, like, okay, I'm making these, you know, the, the typical database uh, API application thing. I'd, I'd rather, you know, study algorithms on pencil and paper. But no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm very thankful for that experience because as my starting off years, I got some good mentorship about like, okay, this is what the best practices are for software engineering and so forth. And very lucky for me, I, I, I think I came in at the right time. Um, we, the group I was in, we've primarily focused on creating video serving APIs, but my director at the time, he decided to pivot the group into, hey guys, we need to be focusing on machine learning. And there wasn't a video machine learning group in Yahoo at the time, which if you think about it, that's somewhat remarkable. But the video is a really, really was is and was a really, really big opportunity for anyone who's looking for startup ideas. But the biggest apps are like what, TikTok, um, Snapchat, Instagram, and they're all very video heavy. Uh, okay, so we can process a video, get a bunch of metadata about it, and then do something useful with that metadata. Uh, it first started off with just doing proof of concepts with the uh, Yahoo had a license agreement with the National Football League. So the first thing oh, I created th was th that, that that that's a really good opportunity, actually. <laughs> then. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've had a yeah they've had an ongoing thing. So we just worked on this yeah. uh, project where we would detect the players who were walking onto the field and figure out okay, so there's you can't recognize their faces because they're wearing that helmet, right? But they have this big prominent number which follows a certain color pattern, and with a combination of different computer vision algorithms, you can narrow down who it is and then pull up stats about the player. And that project impressed the executive. So the group was started and it grew very fast. And uh, as the group was expanding, I grew out of a being a, a engineer to a manager and stayed with the, so I think that happened in something like 2018 or so late 2017 early 2018 and yeah stuck with the company and i moved to indonesia not too long ago about nine months ago i think and couldn't keep working for yahoo unfortunately because of the visas and taxes are too complicated so been mostly doing full-time advising for startups at this point in time that, that's that's actually amazing uh i mean your whole journey from a developer to uh, like uh, machine learning and then an opportunity to become a manager i i think only uh few developers get that opportunity to see both sides of the world basically mm -hmm. so looking looking at like how de uh, like detailed the engineering is and then how to handle people i guess management is more about people right so could mm -hmm. you talk more about like what was your experience between like being a developer and your transition from developer to manager how was right. it? Yeah, I mean, it's not an easy transition, I would say. I yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a scary one, but it requires a different set of skills. And when you're a developer, you're primarily evaluated on, are you delivering the code we ask you to deliver on time and with the right level of quality? And if you keep doing that again and again, you will get promoted. Uh, up, to, up to a certain point, maybe the, the very yeah. senior levels, it, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. But you're not evaluated on that basis with, uh, when you're a manager. It's how much value are you delivering for the company? That's what you're evaluated on. And so you could write a lot of code, you could write no code. It, it's not going to have a very direct effect on how you're evaluated. And with the, when you're a developer, you, you are very, very in control because you know exactly what the system is doing. And um, if something's wrong, you know how to address it and the buck stops with you. But when you're a manager, you cannot possibly keep 
be <laughs> intimately familiar with the works of 10 people. And it can sometimes feel like you're surfing a very big wave. So that's really great when everything is synchronized and you have the power of 10 people, you know, putting the wind in your sails. But when that comes crashing down, you cannot just, you know, you cannot just get up and debug <laughs> it, right? So, that's true. Uh, so learning, learning to let go, that was probably the hardest part of the transition for me. I mean, there's many other skills that I could talk about, but that one I remember, I, I had to take a lot of feedback constantly from my superior and he was, you need to delegate more. You need to delegate more. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think you have hit, hit the nail over there because as, as a developer myself, I, 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 I prefer to control things because I, I, I know how it will go. Even when choosing a technology, I prefer technologies that have more freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. that I can exercise but again when you transition from a developer or who's a hardcore developer who's technical who's been sitting in the corner maybe I mean uh, the way people describe developers these days like mm -hmm. a person sitting on the corner not pairing with anyone uh, and have no human skills and then going to a management and becoming an accidental manager I think th that transition mu must be really hard for you right how, how, how did you train yourself like to get to that level that that transition? I think that's a really good question because I think one flaw a lot of companies have is they don't like, it takes four years of training to become in school to become a, a passing developer, right? Like people who come out of school, they can definitely do useful things, but there's still a lot that you don't know. And that's with four years of, okay, maybe two of those you're studying like history or something like that, sure. So it's, a, let's say it's two hardcore years of really, you're getting done until dusk, you're grinding how to become a better um, uh, developer. And then after that, you're only good enough to get started. You're not rock star level yet. With a manager, you don't even get that kind of a training unless you have an MBA. <laughs> Most engineers don't have an MBA. So there's no, uh, it's a different, I'd say different people's journeys are different. What it looked yeah. like for me was, I mean, for one thing, it, it was a good thing I already had a lot of fascination with business and leadership was, I thought that was a useful skill. I read a ton of books, a ton, a ton of books. My, I think my audible thing is like at 20 days worth of content now that I've listened to according to them. Um, <laughs> not all of it is about business and leadership, but I recognized like, I mean, I, ha I have to be getting good information from somewhere. It's not just going to happen by accident, right? So being in a situation where, okay, I have a new responsibility and I haven't really received that much formal training in it and I'm not going to receive formal training in it. What can I do about it? Now, I'm not saying someone I'm not saying someone needs to read a ton of books in order to be a successful manager, but you do need to get it from somewhere. You know, maybe, even if you have some natural talent, you still need a coach of some sort, right? So I actually did have an executive coach for some time and I guess I still do. So that they're quite expensive. So I didn't meet with him that much, but <laughs> but it's but it's good to have some sort of a framework, right? Whatever I'm not I'm not gonna say this was my framework and everybody should use it, right? But, but but there needs to be something because that two years of training isn't just going to appear all by itself. That that that's definitely true. I I, I think it it will be really good for uh, like all the developers who are listening to this conversation. I I, I can I can uh, basically vouch for it because I, I'm actually doing uh, like going going to management training myself right now. So I I can I can see the difference and the term that I use accidental manager is 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 actually a coin term where developers basically go from uh, technically strong people to manager. But I think Jeff uh, they can definitely learn a lot from from what, what you just said. Do you have like any any books in mind if you want to throw out there I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot <laughs> sure um well there's two that i think if you haven't read these less yet you're missing out uh the first one is by andy grove intel it's high output management and the other one is the effective executive by peter drucker so what i really like about these books is that they boil down the essentials of like what okay you're a manager like now what right How, what what frameworks should you be having what should you be prioritizing how do you prioritize things and i really feel like they you know, like all of computer science can be broken down into like, okay, we have data structures and algorithms. That's really all there is at the end of the day, right? Uh, I mean, I guess, I okay, maybe we should have operating systems and hardware design too, but there's only a few fundamentals and those uh, books cover it very well in terms of like, at the end of the day, your job as a manager is to create value for the company. That's, and what, what does that value look like and how do you accomplish that? Those, those are things that will branch off into their own areas, but you really need to come back to that. And once you, once you have that framework, then things may Makes sense and it doesn't feel like you're making haphazard decisions Th thank you so much for that advice i, I think that that is, that is brilliant especially 
uh, uh, I mean, I was looking at, at your LinkedIn and you were promoted from uh, an engineering manager to senior engineering manager. I want to go in depth in that journey, but not right now. I, this is a very short interview. So I'm, I'm going to just start going closer to the meat of this interview. So you, you, you were talking about in your intro, like uh, you went from uh, like working with Yahoo to coming to Indonesia, but you didn't mention like, how did you enter the Web3 world? What, what, what was your like way into it? Accidental also, I guess. <laughs> I became an accidental <laughs> Web3 developer. Yeah, so I mean, when I came here, I didn't have a job per se, except for some old consulting clients that I had in the US. And, but I didn't, I mean, okay, it's, it's pretty cool to consult for US clients and live in a cheap country. That's pretty awesome. But you need to build connections inside of wherever you move to. That's what really matters in the long run, right? So when a, a friend of mine approached me and said, hey, we're trying to build these NFTs for an artist. And I mean, I had heard of NFTs to the effect of like, oh, someone, there was a JPEG that sold for $69 million or whatever it was. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> people yeah and i was just like okay yeah that's pretty cool uh but i didn't i mean i i, I had read about blockchain so i understood like okay th this is what the block hash is for this is what difficulty is this is how um the byzantine consensus model and whatever but in terms of actually programming a smart contract i had not even heard of open zeppelin yet so <laughs> that's uh like you know i had studied computational theory in grad school so all of the you know, theoretical stuff, but when it comes to actually putting it together, that was not something I had experience with. And so I had to, I mean, Solidity is not terribly difficult to learn. Um, and creating a simple NFT uh, is not difficult either. So, but of course I was quite aware that, that you're dealing with real money. So that, def that definitely, uh, <laughs> I mean, okay, you know, I'm going to program this thing and it's going to have tens of thousands of dollars in it, like overnight. Like that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty frightening. And then you, you mess up, I mean, like even if the money is not lost, if you mess up, then the customers are going to be quite angry. Right. So, uh, I think it took me yeah, about a month before I going from like, what's open Zeppelin to make my own NFT and actually feel like I know what I'm doing. J just about, about that uh, thing that you said. So, uh, like as a developer, who's just starting into, uh, like this NFT world, uh, the, like, did, did you just started working on a client's project or did you, did you do your own experiments first? Like, how, what, what was your approach in that sense? Right. Well, that's in this case, because I was working with a friend of mine, um, I thought it was a little funny of, of him. Like, dude, I don't have experience with this. Why don't you just hire somebody online for this? But he's a very, very conservative uh, business person. He was just like, you know, I could hire some random person, but I don't know if they're going to program the smart contract to take the ether away. And then if they're online and I don't know where they are, they could just disappear. So if it wasn't for his paranoia, I wouldn't have taken on the project uh because <laughs> he, he felt it was a bigger risk to hire a random person than a developer who didn't have previous solidity experience so um i mean we're I'm, well, both of us are very happy that he made that choice but in that case uh, i was accidental and lucky there if there's i mean you, if i had just pitched myself to some random person like hey let me develop your uh, smart contracts well first of all i wouldn't even have thought to do it because uh, i thought okay you know nfts are cool but why would i get into it this friend of mine was so enthusiastic about nfts so his enthusiasm and, and of course, I already trusted him too. And he, but his, I was like, all right, look, you're so fired up about this. I just have to see what's going on. So <laughs> that pulled me into this space. Um, I think that was, so his, our trust in each other and his enthusiasm, I think is what got me in. Thank you, friend. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that that's that's brilliant. I and I think you mentioned. Um, I know I know uh, I shouldn't bring this uh, into this we should, but in our uh, previous issue, you mentioned about mining uh, crypto. Uh, so I did. Do, have, do you want to? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Go oh, ahead. Sure. Oh yeah, I should share that picture. Um, so I did have experience with like I uh, you know I was familiar with the blockchain protocols and let's see here where's that picture? Yeah, I I I've been talking about that picture everywhere. Like that that, that was amazing. <laughs> this so is my brought it over. Yeah. Right. So even though I didn't have smart contract experience, well, I did. I did have more of a history with crypto than what I described, but it was only in passing um, interest. Let me just share this. Oh, I need to the share the screen share thing. Oh, sorry. Just give me one second. I'm gonna give you all the permissions you need. There you go. Okay. So here is a stack of GPUs. Um, wow. <laughs> which that, that, well, that wasn't all of them actually, but there's uh, what, six in each row or something like that. And I had six, what were they? NVIDIA 1070 GPUs, that's what they were. So my first exposure to crypto was back in 2015 when I was a graduate student and Bitcoin was making the news because it was worth $900 or something like that. No, 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 that's not true. I was, I do remember hearing about Bitcoin in 2013 at a startup I was working at. And we were joking with each other that Bitcoin was kind of expensive at 30 bucks or whatever, some crazy <laughs> number it was. But in 2015, 
there were some alternative coins coming out, which go by word, which have a name that I guess I can't say on YouTube. But the um, it was a bunch of coins that were they were just basically cash grabs, um, and uh, at least a lot of them were. They were like, okay, we're going to be an alternative to Bitcoin because our block time is faster and our transaction fees are lower and blah blah blah. But they were all just a bunch of proof of work blockchains, uh, just like Bitcoin. And some of them were mineable on like a regular desktop or laptop. And as a student back then who didn't have a ton of money, I was just like, well, if I can mine this on my computer and make money, I mean, like, why not? This is pretty cool. Um, I'm not, I, I definitely don't have those coins anymore and they're not worth anything anyway. But that, that's when I got curious about, okay, wait, how do these protocols work? And uh, how, how, how exactly am I generating value by running these math problems on my computer? And I got interested again around early 2017 when Ethereum was worth 200 something at that point in time. And it was actually profitable to mine crypto uh, on a GPO. And I had free electricity in this apartment, actually. So um, I was just like, well, sure, why not? I mean, it makes sense. So this was, I was not really uh, a crypto believer at that point. I was just looking at the numbers and thought like, okay, yeah, uh, the investment will pay itself off in a couple months and then I can still sell the GPUs afterwards. So there's, there's no way to lose here. So that's what I did. Um, and it was interesting following a bunch of ICOs. I was definitely liked what I saw back then. Like um, some stuff was very clever, like uh, Golem was talking about distributed rendering, I think it was. And Augur was about like a um, prediction, decentralized prediction marketplace. I was just like, wow, th there's some really cool applications <laughs> blockchain but when i could at, at around early 2018 it, a lot of people were mining at that point so i sold off my equipment and i was just like no this is just gonna get worse and uh thankfully the price of the equipment had gone up um yes. <laughs> but the uh, unfortunately because i was just being opportunistic i didn't keep most of the ethereum which is regrettable i just sold it off because i felt like i needed to recoup the cost you should have kept bit at least bought bitcoin at that time yeah. Well, thankfully, after the major crash, um, when Bitcoin went from 20,000 to like 3,000, I was, uh, at this point, I had started to become a little bit more of a believer in the potential of crypto because I had seen these cool applications. So that's when I would start dollar cost averaging at, again, accidental luck at the very exact right time that you should be right after that crash. And um, yeah, so I kept doing that. I, I, I still actually kept, did I ever stop? I think I had been dollar cost averaging that whole time. Yeah, maybe there were some months that I didn't, but the um but that yeah, I should have bought more <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but by the time I had um you know come, come back to the nft thing okay I had a pretty good uh concept of like okay you know what a smart contract is so it wasn't totally foreign but understanding the theory behind smart contracts and actually writing them is not the same thing so I really had to put the time in for that that's true I mean it this, this world is uh like a, a completely different science on its own so yeah th thank you for sharing that how, how you entered into the web3 space and it I guess from what you just said, it, it wasn't accidental to, to me. It seems like it was your destiny. You were mining crypto. You were into the crypto from like uh, way, way, way back. And then uh, your friend just excited that that spark in you. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I guess I, I guess it's my fate. So that that, that that's actually amazing. So now uh, I was looking at uh, Medium. I guess there is one uh, like really I guess I searched blog post online regarding ERC one one five. What is ERC one one five like? Uh, but I, and th this blog post is obviously written by you. <laughs> like whenever we search for it, it's it's it's, it's the most search blog post. Could you talk about about that a little bit? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I continued to work, so when I was working with that friend, we launched a project, the NFT sold. It was, you know, we were all very happy. So he wanted to um, move on to sell another one. But most of the time, I mean, the, writing the smart contract is not difficult. Most of the effort goes into the marketing, right? So yeah. that left me with a lot of time to be working on Solidity. And I was became very obsessed with trying to create something that was as gas efficient as possible. Uh, I mean, part of it was marketing because people care about that, right? People yeah. are they want to know that the devs care right and i mean part of it is a public good right i mean why would you want the fees to be higher than they need to be <laughs> But it, it got back to the point where it was like graduate student level obsession with trying to figure it out. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I enjoyed it because remember how I talked about like I basically had a math major in uh, graduate school. So you can work out at a theoretical level why everything is the way it is. In machine learning, it's all just a bunch of experiments. We throw a bunch of data into the pot, steer the pot. And if it comes out right, then we probably did it right. Now that's, I'm exaggerating, but not by much. So it's, it's a very, very, machine learning is very empirical, but blockchain is 
the opposite of empirical almost it's very theoretical which you predict is going to happen will happen because it's highly deterministic so there was a level of okay wow i feel like i'm back in grad school which was some of the happiest years of my life so i really really enjoyed working through like okay um well theoretically if we need to track this piece of information about who owns what we can this is the minimal amount of represent uh, information we need to represent it and it was actually very applicable from what i had learned back in graduate school so uh, i didn't have a major in blockchain because there were no classes in blockchain back then but yeah. i had the next best thing and that's when i had recognized that uh, if so erc721 is the most common uh format for uh, nfts at least when you have a collection where you have a bunch of different items in it right yeah and a problem with the erc721 specification is that it carries something over from erc20 which you need you need to be able to ask the contract how many items in this collection does a particular address own so if you own three moonbirds let's say and moonbird is using 721 you the moon the contract needs to be able to ask okay zero x five six a b whatever it is owns three or zero or five or one and that requirement forces you to have a more complicated data structure or track more information and every last bit of information you track on ethereum is really darn expensive because just sort of storing um one just writing one piece of information to memory could cost twenty dollars if it's, uh, it's it's the s s load thing that uh, you have described yep. in your training course right yeah that's the uh so s load and s store are what really zing you uh because just <laughs> one variable write can cost 20 bucks of the Ethereum network is congested. Wow. So you want to do that as little as possible. ERC-1155 came out afterwards. It was developed by a gaming studio whose name I can't remember and I feel kind of bad because they deserve credit for it. But they wanted I'll, to- I'll, I'll put, put, put a, a name in the video, okay. so don't worry. It appears right over here. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, but, but they wanted to be able to have a bunch of tokens in one contract. So you might have like swords and armor and um, gold inside of the game and so forth and so on. And because of that structure, you don't need to ask how many items does this person own? It's not meaningful to ask what's the sum of their swords, their armor, their gold. Like that's not something meaningful. It's just how many swords do they have? How much gold do they have? And how much w whatever else, right? But an interesting thing is, is, so you could have like a say, oh, there could be a million gold in the game. There could be 500,000 armors. There could be an unlimited amount of, I don't know, know magic potions or something but the contract allows you to set the limit of each of those unique items to one and when you do that you suddenly have a non-fungible token again now you have a unique collection of all of these different stuff and because you're not required to answer how how much of the different items do you own then that's a, a, a piece of data that you don't need and that cuts down the cost of the smart contract and it still serves the purpose of you know i expect my particular PFP avatar to be unique from yours and that there's nothing else like mine. There aren't two of mine. And ERC-1155 supports that. So what I was trying to do with ERC-1155D is take that concept and just say, well, let's have an ERC-1155 contract that cannot by design have more than one item of each uh, type. And when you do that, th then you can further optimize the code underneath because it doesn't need to have this variability and you can make other like the transfers more efficient too. So that was the inspiration for that. I'm, so I'm yeah, in, 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 in your blog post, uh, I, I, I guess that, that is that is a beautiful inspiration by the way. I, 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 I just have, have more questions about your blog post in regarding mm -hmm. to ERC-1155. So uh, like ERC-721, uh, is for like it's usually used for launching nft collections and they are like profile pictures and if you want to have a token you would use erc20 um and what i, I guess correct me if i'm wrong but uh, my understanding is erc1155 supports both erc20 as well as erc721 elements mm -hmm. so uh in your blog post you mentioned uh something about only uh, launching nft maybe i'm understanding it uh, incorrectly uh, is, is is this uh, like when you say ERC one one five five D, have you made it closer to ERC seven two one? Is that is that what you have done? Yes, that's so. Yeah, the the difference between one one five five D and a regular one one five five is that the contract cannot have more than one instance of each ID. So you could think of a regular one one five five as being a, a set of ERC tokens inside of one contract. But if each ERC twenty token has a supply of exactly one, then by definition then, they yeah. become non fungible. But True. the most important thing is that it integrates with OpenSea the way you would expect it to um because i mean let's face it that's the that's pretty much everyone's gateway into the nft world right and and openc will recognize okay there's each of these one items and because there's only one item it doesn't even say oh there's a supply of one it just treats it as a non-fungible thing so the people will not notice the difference on openc when they're shopping for things and tra uh, trading and selling them so do, do you mind if i share share my screen to just show one one of the examples mm -hmm. um so i'm gonna share um uh, just give me one second I know this is completely on the fly, so it will take me. Uh, 
just a minute to open up and yep, launch no my browser so sharing my screen so this is an example of an nft collection it's called mm -hmm. uh, visit pass so in this case this was done uh, using erc1155 mm -hmm. now just so that i can understand because this particular nft collection has more than one items mm -hmm. in it uh, i would use erc1155 is that right but in case of like uh, another type of collection where people are choosing like let, let's use azuki as an example so mm -hmm. where people are choosing erc 721a we could potentially use erc 115d yes because they, they are one unique items per each pfp mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah i, I just uh, i wanted to check it and and what what do you think about like erc uh, 721a as compared to this why, why would i use erc 1155d uh, instead of erc 721a well, it's at least 20% cheaper, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, well, ERC-721A is, um, it's still an ERC-721 contract, right? So it has to keep track of, it's still required by the ERC-721 specification to answer how many tokens does this person own across all of the different IDs? And that extra piece of data makes the gas cost heavier just by design. It's not because ERC-721A is a bad contract, it's well-made, but ERC-721 is a specification that you need to adhere to, to follow the protocol. Right, and the protocol is a bit flawed for the purpose of just having a bunch of unique images inside of a collection. So, well, the one thing unique about ERC seven twenty one A is, you know, you could mint a bunch of um, tokens with not that much more gas cost over minting one. Uh, when I get around to it, I'm going to add that feature to one one five five D also. <laughs> As if you look up the pro the, the uh, contract on GitHub, it doesn't support it at this time. So I guess that, that would be a consideration. But for most, but for most, pro but for most projects, it's just uh, the handicap of having to keep track of that extra data just is going to make it cost more gas. And 99% of applications do not need to answer the question: How many of these uh, tokens do you own? So that that that's actually brilliant. I mean, uh, saving twenty dollar gas on top of like ERC 7218. I think that, that that is that is amazing. Uh and people should go and read your blog post. Uh the link should be appearing somewhere. Or not if if it if it's not in the video, just look at the description. It will be uh, over there in the description. Yeah, now you. you you have been working hard on guess. You have done a lot of research that nobody else I guess nobody I know has or I have seen in the market have done on how to optimize gas how evms work how uh, like when i write a code how does it translate so do you want to talk about that because i'm going to move on to talking about some some of the work that you have done like your training course mm -hmm. yeah so yeah you were correct the so the information about how the solidity Ethereum, well, so there's two things that affect the gas price. One is what exact um, operations are you running on the Ethereum virtual machine? And that you're going to be doing that because of the solidity code that you wrote. But the solidity code gets put through the solidity compiler, which outputs the opcodes, which are run on the Ethereum virtual machine, right? And there's a lot of interaction between what the solidity compiler outputs and what you're charged on the virtual machine. And it, it, the the information to that exists in the core, the Ethereum core developers heads, um, but they haven't shared it with us <laughs> yet, um, which, you know, it's, it's, that's understandable. I mean, you have the yellow paper, which documents everything you need to know about the Ethereum virtual machine. And separately, you have the Solidity documentation, which tells you a lot of what you need to know, but some of it I had to, to triangulate by experimentation and notice, okay, the compiler is always doing this. So I'm going to guess this is a specification and that there's putting that information together was pretty hard because it's not it's not an introductory course you know you, you can't just follow a template that somebody else has uh, created and when you're creating a course if you just if you don't know one piece of information and you're recording and you say like okay these oh wait hold on a second i actually don't know what's going on here <laughs> so um i got hit, i got hit by that a couple times and so i was just like man if i'm, if I'm doing I, I was working on that course like full time for a month at least and I, and I thought like man if I'm going if I'm going through this I mean what's everyone else going through they don't have the luxury of putting this kind of time in so yeah I, I was definitely very happy to put it out because I definitely believe a lot of people will I, I, I can see your hard work Jeff I mean I, I I have completed section one 
of your course and it's brilliant i i i mean i i have i haven't attended any other solid course i've learned uh, by just uh, looking at uh, the tutorials practicing it myself because i couldn't find any of that information anywhere but i i guess this was my best investment like i, I think your course is highly undervalued it should oh, be like at, at least like one or two either yeah more, more more i mean it, it it's so the information is so amazing um i mean i i would have paid for it uh, to be honest but uh people who are watching this video uh, just know that jeff has shared uh a, 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 like a promo link with us the actual course uh, on you yep they're the, basically down there so uh, the actual course was 29.99 and jeff has given us a promo link a promo code that, which would uh, basically bring it up to 1399 which which, which is amazing oh sorry 12 uh, one, one more hundred dollar discount but these these coupons will expire 30 days after the video is posted so so don't double. okay yeah yeah so uh, 30 days is the time period so make sure you like subscribe and uh click on that link to go to that course but speaking again um i i really want to go in in detail uh jeff like th this this course you were talking about like in in the course you have gone uh, into assembly you went uh, in detail uh, looking at how we can optimize gas in that true sense so do you want to just uh, talk a little bit about like uh, on, on that maybe if you can share a screen or some sort of demo so that people know what they are getting into sure um let's see here. i don't have one ready but I, I mean i can describe it at a high level so yeah one thing that if you google how to save gas in google you're going to turn up a lot of results and uh, there's no shortage of material like that. And, and those are useful, but the thing is you don't know why those tricks work, right? So when you are in a new situation and you don't have a list of tricks that you can look up, now it's definitely better to have a list of tricks than not, that's good. But if you're in a new situation where you can't pattern match those tricks, then you won't really know, okay, can I do better with gas costs or am I already close to the theoretical optimal? In fact, how do I even know what the theoretical optimal is, right? That's That was something that when I was starting off solidity development, you know, it, you, those uh, traditional whiteboard uh, questions like, oh, can we do better? Can we do better than O of N squared? Oh, we have N log N. Can we blah, blah, blah. So if you're, that matters, I would say, when you're designing smart contracts. But if you don't have the right framework, you can't answer that question. Like, can we do better in terms of gas costs? Well, I don't know. I don't even know how these gas costs are actually computed, right? So, but the good news is if you, well, if you read through the yellow paper, well, you don't have to because you can take the course. But the yellow paper will explicitly tell you that on an execution that there's four things that will sum up to the cost that you're doing. One is what state changes are you conducting? So a state change is changing someone's Ethereum balance, like transferring Ethereum or storing a variable or uh, logging an event. These are, or creating a smart contract. These are all state changes. The second one is uh, how much memory do you use? It's like the, the Ethereum virtual machines uh, analog of RAM, right? So there's some information you're manipulating as the transaction goes by and then it all disappears. The so memory is of course cheaper than a state change because um, memory is volatile. And the next one that you pay for is the actual opcodes that you execute. They, if you can, um, you can imagine that a multiplication is more expensive than an addition, right? Just because it's a more complicated operation and taking a catch act 256 hash of an information is even more expensive than that. And you know, you can, there's some intuitions, like some operations are heavier than others. And what the Ethereum specification tries to do is model the relative heaviness of these operations and charge you more because the the note the miners who are running your code it costs them computational cost to actually run your code right so they need to be paid according to the heaviness of the computation and that's what the ethereum specification is trying to model and it's all laid out in uh, the yellow paper and in the documentation, which you will find if you take the course. So um, the fourth one is the size of the transaction that initiated the the, the size of the transaction data that initiated the transaction. So let's say I'm trying to mint an NFT. Well, I'm sending over how many do I want to mint? If there's like a whitelist, I'm sending some uh, like either a signature or, or a Merkle proof or something like that. And whatever. So that's a, a tra size transaction like that. But if I'm conducting like a Uniswap trade, then I might say, I want to go from this uh, asset to this to asset to this as asset. Um, I want this amount of, these are, these are some other parameters. So that's a lot more data that you're sending and you're charged based off of uh, that data. So if the data is a zero, you're charged, was it four gas for each zero byte? And I think 16 gas for a non-zero byte. Uh, you can check the yellow paper to verify so that that. That, that 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 is just just a uh, tip of the iceberg guys yeah. like I, I i mean you you haven't seen 
Jeff's course. So if you didn't understand any of the bit that Jeff has said in okay. last few minutes, and if it went above your head, I would suggest getting into this uh, course because okay, I, I, I I I was able to like I, I, when Jeff was just talking, I was like, okay, he he mentioned Kachuk uh, conversion in his th that training video, and then he mentioned about this guess in that video, and the most amazing thing that I found about this course was like I didn't know that. You get a refund on gas. Like mm -hmm. that, 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 that's that's something that Jeff has highlighted in his course. Like you, you don't always pay gas. You actually get refund when you do. Um, I'll, I'll I'll leave that as a mystery. Like what, what operation you do? <laughs> you you need to yeah. take that course. I yeah, I, I believe in that. There's definitely a lot of rules about how Ethereum prices things because you can sometimes even the same transaction can have wild swings depending on what exactly wild swings in cost depending on the transaction that you're doing so yeah but the these four things on the execution side are all that goes into it so once you understand the details of uh, those things then you know everything that there is to know and you can answer intelligently can we do better so it's mysterious uh, but you can know everything that there is to, that you need to know and that's the point definitely of the definitely I, I I think what 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 you just described it's it's it's, it's a really amazing thing I mean uh, again looking at the course I, I gained a lot of knowledge from it uh, to be honest, I really think it's still very, very cheap <laughs> in terms of like the value that it is adding. It is saving at least two months of effort for a developer uh, like me to go and like read the whole paper, summarize it, and then uh, explain it in a way that is understandable. Even things like um, like uh, in one of your training videos, you mentioned about uh, where did this nine uh, gas uh, go? So you broke it down like into three gases spent over here, three gases spent over here, and you're relating it to the actual yellow paper. So really, really, um, th th I found it really amazing. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Jeff, uh, I, I know, I mean, uh, right now, everybody who's watching this uh, is looking up to you as, as a guru. Um, right and and you are like you are my teacher so i i respect uh, i respect you <laughs> in in that oh, thank you. because you, thank you. You, you 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 are training me in, in that uh like in that training course so th first of all thank you for creating that but i i want to know like what was your inspiration like who who did you learn from who who are the people that you get inspirations from any books people uh youtubers any anyone okay well in the solidity world uh there's a YouTube channel called Smart Contract Engineer. So if you are a beginner at Solidity, this, I, I really liked how this person ex explained it. The, the guy behind the scenes, if you look him up, he hides his identity, but he identifies himself as uh, Tasuku Nakamura. Hopefully I said that right. But I felt his exp the explanations on the Smart Contract Engineer YouTube channel are really, really good. And that's how I learned Solidity. Um, in terms of the other uh, Smart Con, well, I guess the other Solidity engineer who I really was inspired by was a guy named, uh, let's see, here, Vittorio Minacori. So he pushed for the ERC 1363 design, which is yet another token thing, but it's a replacement for ERC 20. And a flaw of ERC 20 is that you need two steps to initiate it. You need to approve the smart contract to take the balance out of your wallet, and then you need to actually transfer it, or you need to trigger the transaction in the smart contract that will take the balance out of your wallet. And of course, giving a smart contract permission to take things out of your wallet is there's been a lot of security failures because of that. It's not a good design. Uh, and there have been several upgraded tokens that have tried to fix this in one way or another, but they've all you're forced to be backwards compatible with ERC20, right? Because there's too much DeFi applications that use it. So you, you can you have to be compatible. But that constraint has led to a lot of strain, a lot of just shortcomings that made the new designs unacceptable. Either they cost too much gas or they introduced a re-entrancy bug in places you didn't expect it and so forth. And this guy really got the spec right and created a EIP, which became the ERC and which I'll feel very happy with myself if I create an ERC20, uh, ERC, if I create an ERC spec in, in general um, or Ethereum improvement protocol that gets finalized if you want to be technically accurate here. Um, so I think he really contributed something and he did this, I think in 2020, which is forever ago in crypto. So it, it and just now I think open, I think open Zeppelin is starting to uh, create a version of the code that he wrote. So that, that just shows you how ahead of time this guy was. That was, that was pretty awesome. That, that, that's actually amazing. Like, I mean, uh, your inspirations are also like on another level, we, we can all see that and hope you, you get a chance to create an EIP one day and uh, we would be looking forward to it. Uh, one, one, I guess, 
just by uh, from this conversation uh, one recommendation would be like if you can create an eip for a more secure contract maybe uh, like so there are two things that are, uh, we really need something that saves gas and something that is secure especially uh, these days when uh, people's wallets are getting hacked by just clicking on discord links and the mm -hmm. nfts are being transferred if and if, if you uh, uh, like had another approval method at the second step probably it would have stopped uh, them from like stealing all the nfts so that that could have been uh, like amazing but we are coming to the end of this interview now so uh, I, I just want people to be able to reach out to you uh, because you're so amazing i i, I really want <laughs> you to get get that inspiration get get, get that uh like uh, i i guess you are right now when i'm looking at it you have so much to offer and uh, your training course is one one way that you have generously uh, distributed your knowledge um it's almost free for free i mean i you, you can just get a burger for 12 pounds <laughs> to, to be honest so that, that that is like very cheap and in like what, what are other ways to reach out to you and, sure. and uh, get, get your services uh, well, my website is uh, web3jeff.com, so web3jeff.com, and that has all of my links. Uh, people, I mean, really, you can re LinkedIn, Twitter, direct messages. I'm available, all of those. Um, my contact information is on the website, so you can just scroll to the bottom and click on the appropriate icon. And but, yeah, uh, please, feel free, yeah, please feel free to reach out. Um, I, I definitely like meeting people. So even if it's just, oh, I just want to share my idea and just bounce something off, you know, I'll send you my uh, Calendly link for a 30 minute call. So please reach out. So uh, just one last question, I guess, how, how do people see you? Uh, like, are you a consultant? Are you a developer? Are you a teacher who like, how, what, what, in what aspect can people approach you? Uh, that's a good question. I guess officially, uh, I'm a startup advisor, but I mean, because the people I end up consulting mostly for are, they've just ended up being startups for the most part. So, but I guess I, 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 I think that's a really, that's a really good question. You got me on guard. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a startup advisor, I guess, but I'm more than happy to uh, talk about whatever technological needs you have regardless of what profile you feel like you fall into so thank you so much jeff uh like everybody th that's jeff uh he's the brilliant guy who basically created erc 1155d and uh the training course which will save you like two months of hard work and effort and i i see him as my guru so please go and follow him on twitter the links are below uh, go and uh, speak to him. Um, I'll, I'll probably share his email address if he uh, allows me to. Uh, and the, don't forget to go and join the training. You have only 30 days. Go now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.